<laughs> good afternoon, San Francisco. I, I hope you've had a good lunch, and uh, thank you for being here. First of all, thank you for supporting conservation, um, and I hope to uh, keep things interesting uh, so that you don't fall asleep. I know it's, you know, you've just eaten. <clears throat> so, um, uh, my name is Louisa. I'm from Marisat. Uh, the oceans uh, and our, our seas actually regulate a lot of life on Earth. Uh, they're important for many eco services, uh, ecosystem services that support our, our living, whether directly and indirectly, whether we can see it or whether we can't. Um, marine mammals, by virtue of being top predators, long-lived and you know, large body size, are sentinels of the ocean health. Uh, they're amazing animals, they're intelligent, and, and that's why I love them. I wanted to... Um, up here on the screen are five different species of marine mammals that I work with uh, back home, where I come from. Most of you, I think, would be familiar with the Amazon River dolphin, which are, which are pink in color. Uh, but in Southeast Asia, where I'm from, in, uh, we have the, our rendition of pink dolphins. These are called the Indo-Pacific humpback dolphins. Um, they are born gray, and as they mature, they slowly become pink. And by the time they're fully mature, they're, they're about 70 to 80 percent pink and gray. Next, next to the dolphin are dugongs. So I've been getting a lot of questions today about dugongs and manatees and what, what is the difference. And I'll, go, um, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about dugongs later on, but basically dugongs are um, closely related to manatees. You think about it like, um, I guess, tigers and lions. They're both big cats, but they're different. Uh, and as well as they, they are actually closely related to elephants. So if there are any elephant fans in the crowd, they have tusks. Dugongs have tusks. Um, male, mature males have tusks that will erupt um, and be inside the mouth. Um, and for, like for manatees, they inherited the toenails on the pectoral um, fins. So dugongs are a large um, marine herbivore. Um, they eat only seagrass. Um, next to it is the Indo-Pacific bottlenose dolphins. I think bottlenose dolphins, most people are familiar, you know, um, starting with the movie Flipper. Um, these guys here are peculiar looking. They're very cute. They're very difficult to study. Uh, they're called Irrawaddy dolphins. Uh, they are found throughout um, Asia, uh, certainly throughout Southeast Asia. We have riverine populations and we also have coastal populations. So the ones that I study are coastal populations. And um, this one here is the Brutus whale. Brutus whale is one of the smaller species of baleen whales that we have in the world. Um, they're a tropical species of whale. Uh, and and I'll, I'll show you um, a little bit of, about Brutus whales later on. So I am from Malaysia, as Joyce mentioned, which is right here. We sit, uh, we're a multicultural tropical country that sits right on the equator. We, are, we sit right at the heart of Southeast Asia, nestled between Thailand and Singapore. Uh, I come from Peninsula Malaysia, which is over here, and um, some of you might have attended a talk earlier today uh, by the guys from Hutan, uh, in uh, who are from Malaysian Borneo. So we are over here um, in San Francisco, and you can see that I'm miles from home. <laughs> but, but I'm really, really happy to be here. Thank you, WCN, for, for inviting me here. So the story begins um, as a 10-year-old Louisa who, um, who grew a love for, for marine life. This is a picture of my scrapbook, which I've kept since I was a kid, where I would um, cut out articles about marine life, not just dolphins, but any marine life, and I would put it into the scrapbook. As a kid during school holidays, my parents would take us to the seaside a lot, and I knew from a very young age that I wasn't cut out for a um, regular office um, job. And by the time I became a teenager, around the age of 13, uh, like a dog obsessed with a bone, I became really obsessed with dolphins. For no real good reason, except for the fact that they tugged at my heartstrings, they were very cute, um, very charismatic, and you know, I, I just fell in love with them, seeing them in magazines, um, in, on TV. And um, I, I said to myself, one day, I want to become a dolphin scientist and conservationist, and I'm going to go abroad and seek my training, and, and after that, I'm going to come back and s start my own research um, institute in Malaysia. Because at the time that I was obsessed with dolphins, I didn't know of anyone in the country who you know, did anything or did much with dolphins. 
So off I went to Hawaii to get my undergraduate degree and then onward to Oman uh, to do field work for my PhD where I had the privilege of studying spinner dolphins in the Gulf of Oman uh, and the Arabian Sea. Um, if any of you here are travelers, I re highly recommend Oman as a country to visit. It's beautiful uh, and um, it, there are lots of marine mammals there uh, <clears throat> that you can see. So this, this whole process of studying took nearly 10 years, when, and then I finally returned to Malaysia, uh, where I would finally get this dream you know, up and running. Uh, and I hit a little bit of a roadblock because I was starting to establish myself back in Malaysia, trying to find a project for myself. Uh, actually, somebody very distinguished said to me, you know, you should go and do real science. This dolphin watching thing, you should just keep as an annual hobby. I was, you know, I was stumped. I, I thought, what? I've been chasing this and working towards this dream for, you know, for, for as long as I can remember. How can you, how can you tell me that I, that I shouldn't? Um, so anyway, I, I sort of sat in the moment for a while, was upset for a little while, and I said, you know what, no, I'm not going to listen to this person. I'm going to, uh, you know, carry on and, and, and pursue this ambition. And I'm really glad I didn't listen to this person, because if I did, unlikely I'd be standing here today telling you the story. So things got better uh, when about 10 years ago, I met this guy. His name is Fyrel. Um, he couldn't be here today, unfortunately. Uh, and we found that we have a shared vision um, for marine mammals in Malaysia. We, ha we had the same passion for marine mammals. We wanted to do the same things. We wanted to discover more about them in our country. Uh, and we wanted to pr um, do something to protect them. But I think even at the time that we were discussing about all this, we didn't really know the true meaning of what conservation really meant. Um, but anyway, long story short, we both established um, a Maraset together in 2012. And um, you know, people laughed at us at first. They thought we were crazy, and they said, "You know, you, you're not gonna, you're not gonna succeed because no, it's not not really been done before here." So, but we said, "You know what? We're just gonna throw caution to the wind, jump off the deep end, and go for it." And um, and one of the things that we, you know, that motivated us was was um, this, actually, wanting to make our science matter, wanting to do conservation work using information that we would collect um, to, so that we could make uh, recommendations for conservation. And one of the things was that we simply wanted to communicate science to a wide and appropriate audience so that we could reach um, impactful conservation outcomes. So, as I mentioned, in 2012, Marisat um, was registered as a nonprofit in Malaysia. And after, after we registered, we actually needed to open a bank account. Um, neither he nor I had money, and neither he nor I wanted to you know, borrow from our parents. And so we said, what do we do? We need to open a bank account. So for six months uh, from that point, we, we asked all our friends and families and their friends and the neighbors to please donate us any unwanted items that they had. It could be pots, pans, clothes, shoes, bags, whatever, toys. So we collected um, everybody's junk for six months, and at the time I was still living with my parents, and my mom nearly kicked me out of the house. She was like, well, can you please get rid of this junk already? Um, and we ran a three-day garage sale and earned the, you know, the first $1,500 that we needed to open our bank account. And um, thank you. And, you know, being here today is a big deal because it, 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 it tells, it reminds me, you know, how far we've come since the day of the jumble sale. Um, so, Marset, you know, we, we set up Marset because we wanted to do science for conservation, but we also wanted to bridge the gap between policymakers, scientists, and the general public. You know, we didn't want the, the, the work that we do just to remain within a very technical domain. We wanted to ensure that it could get out to the people who could make decisions, uh, and, and to you, and, and to everybody around us. So what does Marset really do? Um, most people think that I do this, uh, that I spend my days in bikinis, swimming around in the sea, uh, and when I'm done, I would be on the beach getting a suntan and sipping piña colada. But uh, contrary to popular belief, actually, um, we do a lot of this. We spend long hours at sea searching the water for dolphins. Um, and, uh, you know, we spend nine hour days, 11 hour days sometimes on the water um, looking for things. Because, as I mentioned, when we started, we had nothing. 
we didn't have funding, but also we didn't have information. And how can we, how can we do conservation if we don't have information? I, I didn't know where, where the animals were, I don't know what the threats were, I don't know what the conservation needs was. So we spent a lot of time doing research, uh, photographing them, recording their behavior, counting them, um, looking at you know, what human disturbances were in their habitat, looking at the state of their habitat. Sometimes we would have to deal with uh, dead animals that we came across, which was an unfortunate and fortunate situation at the same time. Unfortunate because we would have lost an animal from, from the population, but fortunate because, um, you know, dead animals are actually a gold mine of information. We can learn what happened to them, we can try to understand why they died, and we can figure out what to do, you know, for those that are still out there living in the wild. So going back to this slide, where this is what, you know, um, there's the perception that uh, many of us marine mammal scientists do, which is, you know, swim around with dolphins. Actually, after doing all that, we are left looking like this. <laughs> we have learned the art of falling asleep in any position on the boat because we're so tired. Um, but you know, when Farrell and I first started Marset, we thought that for the rest of our lives, we would just study dolphins because that's what we loved, and, 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 and so we'll just do it till the day we're old. Um, but it was through you know, establishing Marset and doing all this research and wanting to apply the work that we found that we needed to do um, so much more, and, and, and so much more we do now. So we do a lot of outreach um, and education um, programs. Now we have a program called the Sea Science and Schools program, as well as the Blue Classroom program. Um, we do a lot of policy, oops, sorry, policy advocacy work uh, back home in Malaysia, where we contribute to, um, you know, policy development, management plans, and it was very important that we build capacity. So, you know, when, when we, Fire and I separately had this dream, we both felt like we were alone, and what platform could we could we get on to, to pursue this dream? And so it was very important that we build a capacity because of course there's also a lot of work and I, you know, I can't be doing it all by myself, neither can he. So in a nutshell, this is what we do. Um, and I'll elaborate a little further. So these are the two uh, main um, cetacean species that we work on um, in Malaysia. Once again, that's the uh, Indo-Pacific humpback dolphin, which is pink in color when they're mature. Um, and these are Irrawaddy dolphins. Uh, which uh, most of the time they don't look like this. Most of the time they just kind of almost barely surface and then go back in the water. So this was a very lucky shot. Um, they have a rounded head, which is you know, quite peculiar, um, unusual, uh, different from you know, the usual dolphins where you're used to have seeing them with a, with a beak. And I just want to point out this picture here. This is actually a newborn Irrawaddy dolphin that was swimming with a group of humpback dolphins. Not something we see very often in the wild. Um, we don't know what, so you can see it's newborn because it has these lines we call fetal folds. So baby dolphins are folded when they're in their mother's womb. So when they're born, they have these lines. Um, and as they grow, the skin stretches and the lines sort of disappear. Now, we don't know what, what, what was going on here because there were no other Irrawaddy dolphins around. So we don't know, did the baby get abducted? Did the baby lose its mom and got adopted? But I think this picture for me is a reminder that there is still so much that we do not understand and so much that we do not know, and therefore there's still so much that we need to do. Um, just to show you very quickly, this is a, a small collection of some of the animals that we have studied in the last decade. This is a method called photo identification, which is a very uh, common method that we use in marine mammal science. You can see each um, dolphin has different nicks and notches and pigmentation on their, on their fins. Some we've seen more often than others. Uh, some we've only seen once and never seen again. You can see I've given some of the more easily identifiable ones nicknames, but they all actually have unique ID in our catalog. Um, this guy here, we see him quite often. Um, it, uh, his name is Flop, for obvious reasons. Uh, and Flop was the unfortunate um, victim, probably, of a you know, boat strike or some sort of entanglement that disfigured his um, dorsal fin. And it flops, actually. When he, when he jumps and breaches, it sort of flaps around. It's very cute. <coughs> so, oh, sorry. 
<laughs> so yeah, we use this to estimate population abundance as well as um, the movement of animals. So people always ask me if I tag our dolphins. We don't tag our dolphins for various reasons. Um, however, we can use this to monitor where they move from coast to coast, north and south, um, you know, near shore and offshore. <clears throat> I just wanted to bring to light the issue of the scourge of marine plastics upon our ocean. Um, you might have seen a lot of it these days on social media and the news, heard about it on the radio maybe, but you know, for, for me and my team, this is a huge reality. Uh, we see it all the time when we're out there serving um, animals. Uh, you can see it. these are um, Irrawaddy dolphins. Um, that's flop right there with you know, plastic water bottles. Um, and it's happening all the time. These animals are really swimming in a sea of plastic, at least where we are. I think in Southeast Asia, a lot of mismanaged uh, waste goes from land into the sea. Um, Malaysia certainly ranks eighth, I think, on that list. Um, so one of the things that we've decided to do, because we keep seeing this and it breaks our heart, and, you know, and we, pick, we pick up what we see, but it's never ending. So one of the things we try to do is uh, we created this ocean maze. Uh, we, we set it up in malls, uh, in public spaces, and in a segment of the ocean maze, we have recreated the sea of plastic, where one would have to walk through a curtain made by plastic strips and you know, have to sort of try and dodge these water bottles, slippers, fishing nets, um, you know, above them. So if you're someone a little taller, you're bound to get stuck in the, in the net above you. So just to give people a, an immersive experience of what it feels like to be an, a marine animal swimming through a sea of plastics. Um, so again, just to sh highlight, the problem is real. It, the, this is us on surveys, on beach cleanups. The poor seabird was not spared as well. Um, this, was, uh, we, this was while we were diving in our dugong field site. This is an octopus, if you can see. He's using a bowl that's made out of styrofoam. And with him, for his companion, he has uh, food packaging uh, right there. So um, we took that photograph. Of course, we, we, we didn't want to disturb his home, but we did remove that piece of um, plastic from, from next to him. So yeah, we, we get ghost nets um, that we have to fish out of the water just so that you know, we, we, we try to lessen the damage. But the, the thing is that this is never ending and clean, cleaning up is a good thing to do. We need to do it, but it's, it's really the never ending solution. So what, what, what we try to encourage, um, you know, when we run school programs, we try to encourage the kids to live sustainably, try to eliminate single use plastics from their daily lives, things like that. So, you know, going back to things that we put in the sea that are not off the sea, uh, this is the story of um, Mr. Fanbelt. Fanbelt is an Indo-Pacific humpback dolphin that we study up uh, on the northwestern coast, and in August 2017, we first sighted him with this object wrapped around his body. It was looped right around. You can see it was eating into his flesh and scraping it. And um, we wanted to try and catch it, to you know, try and free it, but we didn't have the means to do so. Uh, and nobody around us seemed to have the means to do so. So very sadly, we had to just sort of, you know, leave it be. Uh, in 2018, we didn't see fan belt, so we assumed that he might have not made it. Maybe he died of infection. Maybe he died of, you know, being constricted in movement. Maybe he couldn't eat. Uh, but just two weeks ago, um, here he is, Fan Belt. Uh, we were photographing a group of dolphins, and Sandra, who's here with me, she was photographing um, a, the dolphins. I was looking the other way, and she goes, I think I see Fan Belt, but I think Fan Belt's free of the Fan Belt. So we, yeah, so I, I, are you sure? And, and so we went back that evening, and we, you know, checked back on the photographs, and um, Lo and behold, there was Fan Belt two years later, free of, of, of this object. So we were very, 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 very happy. Um, but again, it's a reminder of you know, the things that animals have to put up with because of what we put into, this, into the sea. And the next slide is a little bit of a hap happy one for me because these are two, um, two mommies that we have in the population that we study. Their names are Gasha and Pink Steps. Both animals have uh, suffered some traumatic injury in the past. We, birth, uh, we first saw Gasha in 2011 and we first saw Pink Steps in 2010. And we know they are mothers because when we first saw them, they already had calves. And um, you can see it's a very deep gash that they've healed from. The message here is that 
these animals have been resilient enough to survive, and they've been resilient enough to survive and go on to become reproductive females. Um, between the first time that we've seen them and now, we think that they've had at least two to three calves because we've seen them through the years with calves. So really, it's a reminder that our work is cut out for us. We need to work a lot harder to protect them, to protect their habitat, because if they can be resilient enough to survive, then we need to really work really hard to make sure that they can really have a good chance at surviving into the future and, and for their offsprings too. And um, <clears throat> recently we started uh, monitoring dolphin sounds. So dolphins rely very much on um, sound for navigation, for communication. They are less reliant on vision. And um, we wanted to understand what are the threats uh, human activities bring to dolphins or any marine mammal that we study by understanding the different the, the changes, if any, in the way they communicate in the sounds that they emit. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Irrawaddy dolphins, but this is what they sound like. So that's a, that was a whistle and then a click train. So we're very excited about this because we are recording their, their, their sounds um, in their natural behavior, so when they are mating, when they are socializing, when they are feeding, and then we are also recording the sounds when there are human activities in the area, vessel traffic, jet skis, um, coastal development, etc. And we want to use the information to be able to provide recommendations for, um, you know, guidelines for boat maneuver, um, vessel uh, speed limit zones, traffic diversion if needed. One of the other things that we do do um, every so often if there's an issue that comes up that threatens the habitat of, of the animals that we study or that threaten the welfare, we do write in to our governments, we do write in to social media, to the news, um, to highlight the problems, to highlight our concerns and to firmly request that they you know, not proceed. And um, we're not activists, but we certainly do um, raise our concerns when needed. <clears throat> so, I want to switch gears a little bit um, and start, you know, um, we've been talking a lot about dolphins, but Marset also actually works on dugongs. So, as I mentioned earlier, dugongs are a large marine herbivore. They can reach um, up to 300 kilograms per animal, uh, and they eat only seagrass. This is an um, aerial view of the Cebu Archipelago. Uh, it's one of our dugong sites. It's the only site in peninsula Malaysia where we can still see large herds of dugongs. Um, it is a marine park uh, within two nautical miles from shore. But, uh, and when we first started doing the work, I actually went in with very little expectation. They're so elusive, uh, and we weren't sure how many there were. I wasn't sure I was going to see many, any or many dugongs at all. Um, but what we found is that we've seen some of the largest herds that we would see in Malaysia. Um, this is an aerial shot that I took from a Cessna. There's actually about 24 dugongs in this frame. Some of them have sort of just gone down. And um, we think that the population here uh, is numbered at less than 100 animals. That's a small population, but a reproductive population because we do see um, juveniles and calves um, every time we're out there. And um, we are also finding that they range beyond the two nautical miles boundary of the marine park. So um, we need to think about, you know, in terms of conservation, what we need to do. <clears throat> this is a calf, a dugong calf, that we, we've been doing work in the area for five years, and this is the one and only time we've seen them underwater. They are so elusive, so difficult to see. And this was a bittersweet moment for me because at, you know, on one hand, I was so excited to see the, the baby dugong, but on the other hand, we saw it because it had lost its mom temporarily. It was frantically looking for its mom. We were just finish up, finishing up with seagrass sampling and suddenly we, we start hearing the sound and, um, and we looked up and there was this poor little thing. I think it thought maybe we were the mom um, and then it sort of passed us twice. And so it was calling out for, to its mom. I'm going to play a recording, which is not from the baby dugong, but um, 
you know, a lot of people, th they're called sea cows as well. So a lot of people think that dugongs sound like cows, so like have a low moan, or some, I've heard somebody tell me that they sound like lions. Um, but actually, dugongs sound like this. They sound like birds. So um, my skipper, when I played him the sound, it just blew his mind. He couldn't accept it. He's like, they're big. I said, yeah. They're vegetarian. Yeah. They sound like birds. I can't deal with this. So, yeah, he had a hard time accepting that. Um, anyway, and uh, so just a very quick summary of, you know, what we've been doing in the area. So dugongs eat seagrass, as I mentioned. These are dugong feeding trails. What they, what they do is they, they go around grazing the seagrass. So they, they munch and uproot seagrass as they go along and they leave this trail of emptiness behind. Um, and, and it sounds like this. So it's a very faint sound. And um, they need to eat between 30 to 50 kilograms of seagrass a day. Can you imagine yourself eating 30 to 50 kilograms of salad in a day? Even if you were vegetarian? I don't think so. I think that's a lot. But they need that to maintain a 300 kilogram body weight. And um, in our site, you know, with our, in our study with local and international collaborators, we, you know, this basically sums up what we know to date about the dugongs. So I did some aerial surveys in the area and with our local collaborators, we did um, underwater surveys to look for feeding trails and to understand um, how, how the dugongs are feeding. And um, we have found that the area in the star is the main area where dugongs congregate um, and the main area where they feed. So we find a lot of feeding trails in that area. Well, we call it the cafeteria. Um, we've also found that dugongs' um, mother and calves like to hang out in a... Uh, slightly south of that uh, hot spot area in an area that doesn't have seagrass, it's just bare, um, but they like to hang out there and I'm still trying to figure out why. Um, we, we found that the mother and calf pairs do not occupy the seagrass bed here, only here. So again, we can start seeing that they're using the area very differently even though these islands are quite close to each other. Um, we are finding that uh, we put acoustic recorders to, to re uh, try and record the presence of animals because, again, they're very hard to see sometimes. And we are finding that this area is a vocal hotspot. So we never visually see any dugongs, but we hear them there. And we think that um, the big question is why. And we think that it's an area for social cohesion, to strengthen bonds, to communicate. I don't know, maybe if we go for some karaoke. Um, but, 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 but it's quite interesting. So we don't really hear much sound here, but we hear that in here in the vocal hotspot. And, um, and finally, all this, all this information that we have gathered in the last four to five years, um, you know, it gathered a lot of attention throughout the last few years. And um, at one point, the government proposed for a dugong sanctuary to be gazetted, which is great because, as I mentioned, the marine park wasn't sufficient to cover the roaming range and, the, you know, um, the area of the dugong and the seagrass. So some of the seagrass are, fall outside of the marine park as well. Oh, and I forgot to mention, these are the two species that they eat in our field site, which is the Halophila ovalis, or spoon seagrass, and the Halodule uninervis. Um, so all that information that we have uh, gathered, um, you know, we had the opportunity to contribute it towards a, a dugong um, a sanctuary management plan when, where we could use it to delineate the boundary of the area that we think should be protected because you know, of, of where the animals are utilizing the area and where they are moving. Um, but as I said, there, there are only less than, we think there are less than 100 dugongs in our population, and in the last three years, unfortunately, we've lost close to 10% of the population from boat strike, unknown causes, uh, entanglement fishing gear. A lot of them were juveniles, and, you know, I'm very determined not to let them go locally extinct on my watch. So we have a lot to do. Um, the dugong sanctuary is still pending. Um, it's not yet been approved. But in preparation, uh, we want to continue monitoring these animals. And in preparation for you know, the coming of the dugong sanctuary, hopefully, uh, we start working with the local communities on the island to ask them you know, what are their thoughts about protection, conservation. Uh, and we started engaging with the local women on the island 
to um, teach them how to sew so that they could um, make unique island, dugong-themed island products that they could sell to the resorts, to tourists. Uh, some of these items are, you know, uh, we brought them here today. You can have a look. And, uh, and, and you know, from a very small organization with a very small team, we're so proud that we were able to put Malaysia on the map on this map, which is the IUCN um, map for the important marine mammal areas. And it's because of all the information that we managed to gather that we were able to uh, nominate these sites um, to be IUCN important marine mammal areas. And we intend to use this as a basis to encourage local conservation action, to encourage our government to take more action um, for these animals. And so, you know, there are many threats out there. There are many physical threats, as I've already mentioned. We've I think overfishing um, is a contributing factor. You know, we've seen skinny animals, pollution, which you know, I think sometimes reduces the um, immunity of these animals. This is a terrible skin disease and this one dolphin that we've seen six years ago and we never saw it again, so maybe it's no longer around. As I mentioned, boat traffic, underwater noise, you know, fishing uh, gear entanglement, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Coastal development, the list goes on. But one of the things that I feel is threatening to these animals the most is, is our lack of awareness, our lack of information, um, you know, which leads to a lack of empathy uh, and also lack of willpower to, to do more for them. Um, sometimes at home there are challenges in implementing conservation action. And we have a saying in um, Bahasa Malaysia, which is our national language, that goes, tak kenal maka tak cinta, which basically means if you don't know, then you don't love. So one of the things that, um, you know, now that we are seven years old, we are still quite young, but we are at the point where the initial years were spent doing a lot of research, but now we have enough information that we are able to run a lot of our education programs with local schools um, uh, in the areas where we work. You know, we teach them about the sea, about marine mammals. We let them experience what it's like to be a marine mammal scientist. And um, through our sea science and school programs, I think we might have reached um, nearly 3,000 students in the last couple of years, just a rough estimate. Um, we run a lot more public events, um, you know, and we take people out on trips so that they can experience for themselves what we see out there uh, and, and hopefully can appreciate the nature of our work and the challenges that these animals are, are facing. Um, and uh, we do stranding response training. We've done them with veterinary students uh, and we've done them with tour operators, fishermen. We run um, awareness campaigns with fishermen. We share information with them. We try to get information from them about the dolphins that they see uh, while they are fishing. Um, you know, how, if they've caught any um, animals by accident in their, you know, the span of their fishing careers. And we've also contributed to numerous um, policy documents, action plans, management plans, um, you know, at the governmental level. So really putting all the information that we know, um, w you know, where it needs to be. And, uh, you know, so in the beginning, it was just Fyral and myself, you saw earlier, and, uh, you know, but this is a team that I'm really, really proud of. We're a small team, we're a core team of five people, uh, and, and um, one of the things that Fyral and a very and I am very proud of is capacity building that we've managed to, um, Marisat has been able to become a platform for young Malaysians who, who like us had a dream but might not have, not, might not have known where to go to um, you know, realize these dreams uh, you know, with marine mammals. And we've given them the opportunity to engage in conservation, in research, uh, and, and they themselves now are building the capacity of you know, the ones that are to come after them. So Marisette is all that it is today because of them. Uh, Fyro and I both had a shared dream and it's, it's, it's now our collective dream together. <clears throat> So I think the next slide, I just want to sort of almost end this presentation by showing you uh, something different. Um, these are um, bubble net feeding baleen whales uh, called Brutus whales. Um, and baleen whales, large whales have never been studied in detail before in Malaysia. And there is a population of whales that we know now are out there and this area is slated for some pretty large-scale industrial development. So this is a project that we want to kickstart next year so that we can get in there to get the information to understand. You might have seen just now one of the whales already had what looks like a 
some sort of a propeller cut on its back. So we want to try and get in there to understand the who, what, where, how, and when of these um, whales, uh, and, and hopefully to be able to put in conservation um, recommendations in place before anything bad happens in this area. So we're going to need all the support we can get. And uh, I just want to end by saying, you know, we treat all our dolphins and dugongs like family members. Um, just want to quote Barry Babcock, we must stop seeing the natural world as a commodity and start seeing it as we would see a family member, something to love, protect, care for, and cherish. So please support us so that we can continue uh, monitoring these animals, uh, so that we can be more innovative with our marine education programs, and we can you know, do better lobbying for policy advocacy. So, and with that, thank you very much.